Hey Beak, so hopefully now you know about the heart's anatomy and physiology. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about blood flow through the rest of the circulatory system and blood pressure. Okay, and this took, don't forget, millions of years of evolution to set up our circulatory system like it is. And it's super, super efficient and uh, it's pretty neat stuff. So let's take a look here. So the physical properties that govern our circulatory system is actually very similar to water and plumbing systems. Our circulatory system is designed to provide each of our cells with a type of diffusion exchange practiced by simple unicellular organisms living in aquatic environments. This exchange occurs at the level of the tiniest blood vessels, capillaries, where wastes, nutrients, gases, and hormones are exchanged between the blood and the body cells. With walls only a single cell thick, capillaries are well adapted to their role of exchange. Most nutrients, oxygen, and carbon dioxide diffuse readily through capillary cell membranes. Salts and small charged molecules, including some small proteins, move through fluid-filled spaces within the capillary cell membrane or between adjacent capillary cells. Pressure within capillaries causes a continuous leakage of fluid from the blood plasma into the spaces surrounding the capillaries and adjacent tissues. This fluid, known as interstitial fluid, consists primarily of water in which nutrients, hormones, gases, wastes, and small proteins from the blood are dissolved. The exchange of materials between capillary blood and nearby cells occurs through this interstitial fluid, which bathes nearly all the cells of the body. Capillaries are so narrow that red blood cells must pass through them in single file. Consequently, blood is sure to pass very close to the capillary walls. In addition, capillaries are so numerous that no body cell is more than 100 micrometers or four thousandths of an inch from a capillary. These factors facilitate the exchange of materials by diffusion. It is estimated that the total length of capillaries in a human is over 80,600 kilometers or 50,000 miles. As blood is forced through this narrow, almost endless network of capillaries, the speed of blood flow drops very quickly, further enhancing diffusion by increasing the amount of time available for the blood and cells to exchange materials. I always like to leave stuff like that in there because uh, giving them credit, you know, for their hard work on these videos, but come on now. <laughs> All right, so a little bit about blood vessel structure and function. A vessel's cavity, okay, is called the lumen. So basically the, the hole inside of the blood vessel is the lumen. And the epithelial layer that lines blood vessels is called the endothelium. Okay, so you can see it here on the inside. Okay, the endothelium of each. And it's smooth and this minimizes resistance. Your blood vessels are nice and smooth and stretchy for the most part. And as you can see here, capillaries have very, very thin walls, right? They have that endothelium plus this basal lamina. Okay, and that's important because you need that wall to be super thin because that's where a lot of the uh, exchange is gonna happen. And as you know, some fluid has to escape, okay, from your capillaries. Whereas arteries and veins, they have an endothelium, but then they also have a smooth muscle layer. You can see it's a little thicker in, in arteries, right, than veins. And then you have the connective tissue, okay, which makes up the outside of the vessel. So why would arteries need this thicker uh, layer here of, of smooth muscle and connective tissue? Well, think about it. Your heart is pounding blood away from it, and it's going through arteries. Right, so arteries experience this really high blood pressure, right? So they're gonna they're gonna need that thicker, tougher wall, 
And uh, that's why they say the blood is flying through those arteries. But then when you get to a capillary bed, it slows down. Okay, so arteries are, are definitely thicker. And then here you can see the, uh, the thinner walled veins. This is just blood flowing back to the heart. And actually, that's one of the reasons your muscles have to be, you know, toned and working to, to help kind of push that blood along through your veins back to your heart. And here you can see the blood flow velocity. So physical laws governing movement of fluids through pipes affect blood flow and blood pressure right so you know a little bit about that if imagine if you had a, a firefighter and he's he's trying to put out a fire with his fire hose but use the garden hose instead and you had that same amount of pressure going through that that garden hose would just shred right it couldn't possibly hold that so it does matter the size of the blood vessel and how fast or how much pressure the uh, solution's moving through it so i really do like this uh this table here you can see that the area of the blood vessels here, okay, you can see it starts with the aorta and then the arteries like arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and then back to the vena cava. So take a look at the area here. Oh yeah, we have so many capillary beds throughout our body, right? Like we said, like 50,000 plus miles worth, that's crazy. Okay, so a whole lot of area. But now let's look at the velocity of blood. So blood is moving along here at a fast rate okay but then all of a sudden it starts to drop down when you get to those capillary beds and that's because again you're losing some fluid there the blood slows down because it's so thin there right the blood travels single file and uh, that's so you can exchange all those materials back and forth okay and then when you're done exchanging your materials mainly dropping off oxygen picking up co2 but there's other materials as well now you're going to go back to the heart through veins and you speed up a bit thanks to your muscles Okay, and then now you can see the blood pressure. Look at the pressure in those arteries, right? That's why when you when you get your blood pressure taken, we're going to use an artery, right? Look at that blood pressure. But once you start losing your pressure at those capillary beds, nah, now we're, we're low. Okay, and we'll talk more about blood pressure in just a second. So what is blood pressure? Again, blood flows from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. And blood pressure is the pressure that blood exerts on the walls of a vessel. So if you have these big rigid walls, you can kind of maintain your blood pressure well. And if you have less rigid walls, the smaller ones, you lose that blood pressure. All right. And as we learned the cardiac cycle, so you had systole and diastole here. Let's see. So systolic pressure is the pressure in the arteries during ventricular systole, right? So that's when you're actually pumping. If you see the, the picture here, if you're pumping, that means that your pressure is going to be very high, right? In the arteries. Whereas diastolic pressure that's when these ventricles are relaxed now you're filling up with blood the heart is taking in blood and uh this is when you're going to have lower pressure right so we'll take a look at the numbers of blood pressure in just a second and then your pulse is the rhythmic bulging of artery walls with each heartbeat so every time your heart beats those artery walls are they're pumping as well okay all right so blood pressure is determined by cardiac output and peripheral resistance due to constriction of arterioles so basically, uh, think back to that hose again. If you have vasoconstriction, that means that your, your smooth muscle layer is pushing in, right? And you're making the hole, the lumen smaller. And that's going to increase the pressure, okay? Again, it's like a fireman taking a big hose and using a small hose. You can't necessarily do that. In this case, that's very could be very dangerous. Sometimes it's, it's purposeful that you do this and you change your blood pressure throughout the day. But squeezing it together and that's called vasoconstriction vasodilation you open that hole back up and blood can flow more easily all right all right so vasoconstriction and dilation help maintain adequate blood flow as the body's demands change okay so for example nitric oxide we can get from uh different things that you ingest in your body and things like that that could be an inducer of vasodilation and you've probably heard of the little blue pill here so Viagra. And what Viagra does, it's called a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. So when cells communicate, sometimes you need that uh, communication to stop, and that's called PDE. So basically, what Viagra does is it stops this compound from stopping a conversation, and thus it's going to allow more blood flow, in this case, into the penis, and it leads to erections. So I bet you didn't think we'd be talking about erections at this point in the lesson, but here we are. Okay. So you have to remember that other forces of nature come into play here. So blood pressure is generally measured in an arm okay in an artery in the arm that it's the same height as the heart okay that's usually why you sit in a chair and have your arm resting on a, on a table or something right next to you 
And for a healthy 20 year old ish is about 120 millimeters of mercury at systole and 70 millimeters at diastole. Now, again, when I was in school, it was 120 over 80. So they lowered that a bit. And uh, again, if you're a little bigger, a little smaller, it might change a bit. Okay, but 120 over 70 is about normal. Now, don't forget, um, gravity plays a role when you stand up right away, right? Did you ever just immediately like jump out of bed and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, you, f you feel a little wobbly or maybe even fainted or something like that? A lot of times that's just because the blood didn't get to your head fast enough and, and start feeding all that and you get woozy and fall over. Here you can see a giraffe with that huge neck, right? So he's going to have a much higher systolic pressure, right? Because his heart has to pump that blood all the way up to the top. Okay, to his evil horns, his evil dragon horns up here. All right, so blood is moved through veins by smooth muscle contraction and skeletal muscle contraction and expansion of the vena cava with inhalation. So really cool, your veins, it's almost like you're, you're forcing little bits of muscle. Now remember, they don't have a huge muscle laying, right? But you have this muscle just kind of pulling it up and your skeletal muscles all day long are actually forcing that blood, okay, back to your heart, which is really cool. And then your vena cava, as it oscillates back and forth, that's also kind of sucking the blood. It's like a negative pressure pulling the blood back to the heart. So because veins don't have this, this pounding that the arteries have from the heart, because remember they, they reach the capillary bed and you lost all that pressure, right? So you have to kind of pull the vein, the blood back. You don't want that to pull. We're talking about gravity, right? So if you're not careful, that blood will pull backwards. So veins have these uh, one-way valves in them. Because the pressure is not too much, you have to have a valve so you prevent backflow of that blood. And these valves can go bad. Okay, so let's take a look. Okay, so let's go back to the capillaries here. The blood flows through only about 5 to 10% of the body's capillaries at a time. However, in major organs, capillaries are basically always filled to capacity, right? Because those major organs are working for us and you always have to feed them. Okay, and uh, blood supply varies though in other sites. So how do we control this blood flow? Well, two mechanisms regulate distribution of blood in capillary beds. First of all, the contraction of the smooth muscle layer in the walls of arterioles, right? So we went from arteries to arterioles to capillaries, right? So contraction of the smooth muscle will certainly change how fast you're, you're shipping the blood, okay? And then you also have these little rings of muscle surrounding, they're called precapillary sphincters. So before you push the blood in, it's controlled by this little tiny muscle here and that'll uh, control how much blood is flowing through there, okay? And it's regulated as well by nerve impulses, hormones, other chemicals. So this is part of homeostasis, right? Increasing or decreasing blood flow is a big thing that you do every day without even realizing it sometimes. So the exchange of substances between blood and the interstitial fluid takes place across the thin endothelial walls of the capillaries, right? We said that these things are so thin that it allows exchange to take place. Now, the difference between blood pressure and osmotic pressure drives fluids out of capillaries at the arterial end and in the capillaries at the venule end. Okay, so basically what's going to happen here is your blood is flying in here, right? And uh, that's a very high blood pressure. Okay, and as you keep moving through the capillary, you can see that the pressure starts to drop but you're always gonna have osmotic pressure, okay? Now, if you forget osmosis, remember, go back and take a look at that. Basically, you're moving from an area of high to low water potential, or you're diluting the solute. Where you have more stuff, the water is gonna move in that direction, right? More dissolved solute particles, okay? So most blood proteins and all blood cells are too large to pass through the endothelium. So basically, you're always gonna have a whole lot of stuff in here. So osmotic pressure is always gonna be bringing fluid back in, but you have a net movement of fluid out of your capillary, right? So you might not have known that before, but sure, your capillary beds are leaky on purpose, right? You're always losing fluid from them. That seems problematic though, right? If we're gonna lose fluid all day, well, there's gotta be some way to put that fluid back into our vasculature or we'd be in big trouble. And that happens at the end of your capillary beds or your lymphatic system. Let's take a look. So fluid returned by the lymphatic system this system returns fluid that leaks out from capillary beds. Okay, so we call that fluid lymph and it re-enters circulation directly at the venous end of the capillary bed, right? So you could just reabsorb thanks to that osmotic pressure because remember your blood pressure eventually is gonna be so low that osmotic pressure can now take over and return some of that fluid, dilute the solute, right? So you could re-enter there or indirectly, you can uh, enter in through the 
lymphatic system. Okay, and then what's going to happen is this will drain back in at your neck, okay, back into uh, your veins so that you return that fluid. So the lymphatic system brings it back and it also has these vessels and it has uh, valves inside of the vessels and the lymphatic system brings all that lost fluid and it deposits it back into your circulatory system. Well, pretty neat. So even though we're losing fluids as we're moving along, you don't lose them for all that long. And you've probably heard of lymph nodes, right? So these are organs that filter lymph and play an important role in the body's defenses. So really cool, you're actually checking this lymphatic fluid for, uh, for possible little pathogens and making sure everything's as it should be inside your blood. So inside these lymph nodes, that's actually, we're going to head there soon. But in your immune system, this is the site. It's almost like a battlefield, okay, where you're learning what these pathogens are and how to fight them and things like that. So the lymph nodes are a very important part of the lymphatic system and they help our immunity. So we said there could be problems though, right? If you have backflow of fluids or if you can't retain enough. So edema is uh, swelling caused by disruptions in the flow of lymph. All right, and as you can see here, this would be a, a normal foot and ankle. So it probably looks like that. But every now and then they could swell, right? And then eventually you could get moderate to severe edema. So you ever uh, take a sock off or something like that. And if you see the, the lines where the sock, maybe the elastic was or something, that could be okay if the sock was really tight. But theoretically, you shouldn't really see that. And if you could start to see indentations, that might mean that you have some edema going on there. All right. And you're not retaining or pulling that fluid back in. And um, like I said, as you get older, or if you have certain jobs where you're on your feet all day and things like that, yeah, you know, you're putting your veins through a lot. Gravity's always pulling on your fluids, trying to bring them down to the earth, right? So the more you're upright, the more you're on your feet all day, which is okay. Um, the more these valves, yeah, they might get overworked a little bit. Okay. Edema means swelling from fluid that accumulates and is trapped in your body's tissues. Edema most commonly occurs in the feet, ankles, and legs, but any part of the body can be affected. The tissues of your body are made up of cells held together by connective tissue. The space between cells that contain connective tissue and tiny blood vessels is called the interstitium. The fluids in your body that are not inside cells are usually stored in your blood vessels and what are called the interstitial spaces, meaning not inside cells. Edema occurs when the tiny blood vessels or capillaries leak fluid into the surrounding tissue spaces. When the interstitial spaces fill with fluid, they expand and the area swells. There are two kinds of edema. In the type called pitting edema, applying pressure to the swollen area causes an indentation that persists after the pressure is released. In non-pitting edema, there is no persistent indentation after pressure is applied. So if ever you're having a bad day, just say the word interstitium a few times and you just feel better. It's good stuff. Well, that's about all she wrote. So I hope that was helpful to you. And now you know a little bit more about how blood flows through all your different uh, vessels and why it's important that capillaries are so thin. What happens to pressure as you go through a capillary? What is blood pressure? Right. And uh, what are some problems if you don't retain or if you can't get that fluid back into your uh, into your blood system? So hopefully that was helpful. Take care.